Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for attending today's webinar. My name is Tom Robbins, and I'm with Kentico. And responsive design is clearly something that I hear from customers all day long. And it's something that I know is really on the top of everyone's uh, list of projects, which makes me really proud to, to introduce uh, a Kentico Goal partner who's really been focusing heavily on how to do things like responsive design. Boston, Inter Boston Interactive is a very well-known agency that's worked with Kentico. Uh, and joining us today is Scott Noonan, who is their CTO, who has a tremendous amount of industry experience. And I think it's fantastic that he's been kind enough to join us today and talk about responsive design and some of the things that we need to think about. So without further ado, Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I just want to quickly thank you and the folks at Kentico for allowing us to uh, talk about responsive design today. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Um, as Tom alluded to, responsive design is really a top of mind for a lot of people these days and has been for, for a little bit of time now. And, uh, you know, with that, I think we just want to talk a little bit today about a few things around, uh, around responsive design, um, talk about really what it's all about, um, consider whether it's a viable solution or not for, for your project, and uh, ultimately, if you decide that it is, then really what's the best approach to go about uh, executing it? A few formalities. Uh, who am I? As uh, Tom alluded to, uh, my name is Scott Noonan. And I've been the uh, Chief Technology Officer at Boston Interactive since 2001. Uh, so I've been here quite some time now. And in that time, have uh, participated in uh, a little over 400 different web projects. I've been uh, in software development now for 30 plus years, pretty much uh, most of my life. And in the uh, web CMS space for the past 15 years. So I've had the, the luxury of, of, and the privilege of really seeing a lot happen in our space and in the digital space, particularly around CMS. And uh, it's really a lot of exciting things going on, and it's given me some good insight into, into how our industry is moving forward. Um, before I move on, I will uh, quickly apologize. I'm battling the back end of a cold, so if my voice cracks here and there, I do apologize in advance. So first of all, what is uh, responsive design? Uh, many of you may or may not know that uh, almost three years ago now, a gentleman by the name of Ethan Marcotte published an article in the list apart. And he, in that article, he coined the term responsive design at the time. Uh, Ethan discussed many things about responsive design and, and what it really entailed. But really, there are two uh, sort of foundational concepts involved around responsive design that he brought to the forefront. The first one was what was known as a flexible grid. And the second one is the use of what are called media queries. Now, the flexible grid is really its not a new idea. It's something that had been with us in web development for quite some time, actually. It was often referred to as adaptive design. And uh, basically consisted of building our site in a flexible manner that would allow it to grow or shrink with the size of the viewport or the user's screen. And this really came about early on in the days when monitors uh, typically were at 800 by 600 resolution. And as newer monitors were coming out and giving us larger screens, we had a lot of white space in our designs. And it was a way for us to sort of uh, build our sites that could grow, really, not shrink, um, and fill that white space. So as you can uh, see by the example I'm going to pull up now, um, this is a very basic looking site, and the idea was that as people had larger resolution monitors, our content could simply flow and our design could expand to fill that. So this was really nothing new, uh, something that had been around for quite some time and, and some coding techniques that allowed us to do this. But this was one of the foundation pieces around uh, building a responsive website. The second concept, and really the, the more groundbreaking piece, was the advent of, of media queries. And basically, media queries came about in the CSS3 specification. And essentially, what they did is they allowed us to determine the width of a user's viewport. And by the viewport, what we mean is their browser window, uh, their device window, the, basically the, 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 the area that they were using to view our particular website. Um, using this information now, now that we have this at our disposal, 
this really allowed us to sort of change the rules a little bit and allowed us to use this information in conjunction with the flexible grid to actually relay out and redesign portions of our page. Um, before, all we could really do is flow things and make them bigger and smaller. Now we could actually do uh, different things with the actual design based on the user's viewport size. So we could take a traditional desktop website like, you're, like you would see here and adapt it and change the way it actually looked based on different viewport sizes without actually having to have different versions of that site. Um, it allowed us to do more than just reflow and grow and shrink. It allowed us to do things like change font sizes, change line heights, uh, turn links into buttons, uh, things of that nature. So ultimately, what does this really mean? Well, this really sort of changed the game for us because prior to responsive design, we essentially had to create uh, different versions of our website. And we would use what's called device detection to determine what type of a device you were viewing our site on. So we would check and see if you're using a desktop, or you're using an iPhone, or using an iPad, uh, whatever you might be using, and then create a specific version of that site around the dimensions of that device. For a number of different reasons, this is really not very ten tenable. Uh, first of all, is device detection is not the most reliable thing out there. There are many situations where we could get misreads on particular devices. As new devices were coming out, we'd have to constantly update our scripts that were doing the device detection to determine what these new devices were. And then, as you can imagine, we had to create a number of different versions of our website to accommodate all of these devices. You know, in the beginning, this wasn't too, too difficult when really we only had a couple of different smart devices out there. But as you can imagine, this just isn't, isn't, uh, isn't tenable anymore. I mean, there are literally hundreds of different devices. We're maintaining uh, all these different sites, uh, multiple code bases, multiple versions of our content. Um, you know, as a result, our, our sites tended to lack consistency. It wasn't always feasible to be able to manage content across seven or eight different websites, so the message would change. We had different people managing those. Um, and quite honestly, just couldn't keep up with all the new devices as they came out. So you know, what happens now is we can now build a website that will respond to the viewport of the device on which it's being viewed. So we really don't care about the device anymore. We can essentially uh, build a site that we know is going to be uh, responding to any device that's out there. One code base, one set of content, one set of messaging, much easier for our content managers, uh, much easier for our development team, much easier for our designers. So you know, for a lot of people, the concept of responsive design sort of ends here. Um, you know, we say, OK, great. We have a website now that can sort of look differently and, and, and maintain its messaging across all these devices. But really, that's only the beginning as we see it. And that's really just the, the surface of responsive design. And what we'd like to do today is talk a little bit more in depth about what responsive design is really about. Uh, secondly, why should we even consider it? And then thirdly, whether or not it's really a viable option for our particular project. Because there are cases where it really might not be the best choice for you. So first off, uh, you know, what is responsive design really about? Well, it's really about allowing our users to easily access and digest our content, regardless of the device. Uh, I say that because I want to make it very clear that responsive design is not only about layout. It's about accessibility of our content. Uh, if we think of things uh, like our tap devices now, our smartphones, our tablets, there are certain features that are available on these devices that aren't available on desktop and vice versa. So, Concepts, for example, like content that might show on a hover state on a desktop just won't work on a mobile environment. So if someone comes to your, your desktop version of your website on their mobile and it requires a hover to view content, it's just not going to be, uh, it's not going to be a good experience for them because we don't have hover states. The other thing that we really have to consider when we're talking about responsive design is also about accessibility, for example, with bandwidth. You know, we kind of gotten we've gotten very used to having really fat internet connections and, and great Wi-Fi and great LAN and, and everything else and great WAN. So now, you know, our websites got really fat and obese, and quite frankly, that becomes a problem for users on mobile. Um, I'm going to give a, a fantastic example that happened to me this past weekend. Many of you may be aware of the uh, 
We're in the Northeast here in Boston Interactive, and we suffered a severe blizzard this last weekend, uh, rendering really uh, a lot of our roads impassable. And for me personally, I lost power on Friday night at my home. Uh, to this moment, I still don't have power. So throughout the weekend, the only real contact I had with the outside world was my, were my mobile devices. You know, I spent a lot of time in my cars charging up phones and tablets. And to get, excuse me, to try to get information that was pertinent was very, very difficult. I had no Wi-Fi connection because of my power being out. As you can imagine, the, uh, the network, the cell network was really overtaxed. So even though I had 4G, it certainly wasn't coming in at 4G speed. And quite frankly, just trying to find information from my local news outlets, trying to find information from my power provider, was almost impossible via my, via my cell phone. It, uh, many of the sites I went to were unusable. I couldn't use them. I couldn't get the information I was looking for. The sites were so heavy they wouldn't download um, before my cell connection would drop out. So you know, that's a perfect example, quite frankly, of why we have to really be considering things, not just layout, but we have to be considering things like bandwidth on our devices now. We're so used to being in that situation where we can rely on high speed but it's not always available to us. And if some of these sites have been a little bit more mobile friendly or done in a proper responsive fashion, I could have gotten the information I was looking for instead of being uh, sort of in the dark, if you will. Secondarily, responsive is really about creating a user experience that's complete and satisfying on any device. And what I mean by that is we use our devices uh, you know, quite differently than we did even four or five years ago. Um, two of the most common ways that we use our, our smartphones nowadays are uh, email and search. Uh, email is a very common one. I probably check 90% of my email on my phone now and nowhere else. And it's not uncommon, for example, for someone to send me uh, links to websites that I need to review or links to articles uh, via my, uh, to, to, to me via email. And you know, if I click on that on my phone, Quite often, one of two things happens. Either the link doesn't go anywhere because they don't have, they have a mobile, what's called an MDOT site or a mobile site that doesn't contain that particular content. Or I might be brought right to their, uh, the desktop version of their site, which is really very, very difficult now for me to have to review and, and, and read on my device. I'm constantly pinching and zooming. This is really not a good user experience, and quite frankly, will often stop me from continuing on with that. I'll wait until I get back into my office and at my desk. Uh, quite recently, I had a very interesting conversation with um, Rebecca Grimm, who's the Director of Customer Engagement at CVS. And if many of you may or may not know, well, the CVS Extra Care um, service that they provide is probably one of the most successful customer engagement uh, services in the country with over 70 million registered users right now. And of their user base, approximately 30% of them view all their information um, from their emails via their mobile phone. And Rebecca was talking about the CVS uh, flu shot initiative, where I'm sure many of you are aware you can get your flu shots at CVS. And the flu shot department at CVS wanted to uh, add a piece into their weekly email to their extra care members about getting those flu shots. But unfortunately, the flu shot website was not mobile friendly. And so even within their own organization, they couldn't add that to their internal email out to their customers because they knew they'd be leading their customers to something that they wouldn't be able to consume on their mobile devices. So this is first and foremost for a lot of folks. And I think you know, most of you out there who, uh, who are reliant on email would probably agree that's a common thing that happens. A second uh, thing that happens quite frequently on our phones now is search. Um, we're always on the go. We're in our cars. We're we're off different places and we're constantly using Google or other search providers to look for information. And the same thing occurs. There's been many times I've been uh, on my phone, searched for something, a location, a restaurant, a hotel information. I do that search. I come to my link in Google. I click on the link. And once again, I'm brought someplace that's not either mobile ready, uh, mobile friendly, or quite frankly, doesn't exist at all. And that can just be ultimately a very frustrating experience for your users. So it's, it's really a big part of responsive. It's about creating that user experience. It's, it's satisfying and complete for everybody. Responsive design is also about being future friendly and uh, ready for the future. Uh, as we talked about before, there are new devices coming on the market all the time. And we can't possibly keep up with those. Um, just common examples are uh, you know, the recent uh, release of the iPhone 5 with a larger viewport than the iPhone 4. 
So you know, if we had an iPhone only type site based on certain dimensions, are we not going to build an iPhone 5 site? Uh, Mid-tier tablets like the Kindle and Nook have certainly gotten a lot more exposure lately. We just can't keep up with those devices anymore. And it's really not only about mobile. It's very important to note that a lot of people are accessing the, uh, the Internet via other uh, avenues, not just mobile devices. Uh, a quarter of all uh, American teens right now use their gaming consoles to, as their primary access point to the Internet. So we have to be thinking about things like televisions and eventually cars and car displays, things of that nature. Responsive is also part of your overall content delivery strategy. I've been saying a lot uh, recently that 2013 is the year of content. And it's really important to understand that and to understand that this is you know, part of your content delivery strategy in the digital sphere. At the end of the day, we all want to deliver appropriate content to all of our users. And responsive design is simply one strategy that we can use to help in this. Responsive design is also about being able to manage one code base and one code repository. We touched on this uh, a little bit earlier. And it's really uh, from a development perspective and from a content management perspective, it's about having one version of everything out there. Uh, the typical term um, used when you have it across disparate systems is what's called forking your content. When you have uh, you know, content or you have code in several different areas and then trying to maintain that. It really just becomes a, an increasingly losing battle. Um, in, a, in a recent article, uh, Facebook uh, made note that they have approximately 7,000 different devices accessing their website every day. And that's a pretty astonishing number. Uh, I'm not sure I'm completely on board with 7,000 different mobile devices, but there are certainly you know, at least four or 500 ones that are being used on a regular basis. And as you can imagine, it just wouldn't be possible to try to manage four or 500 different code bases and different, uh, different repositories of content. I mean, in the end, like any digital project, responsive design is really about your content and it's about your user's experience. That's the most important thing to take from this. And that's really the same goal for any digital project. We really have to be considerate of our, of our users. And we really have to be considerate of the message that we're trying to put out there. And that's really our content. Uh, that really is the most important part of any project. And that's really the crux of responsive design. So why should we really care about this stuff? Well, I, I think it's fairly obvious in many ways. Um, I kind of uh, gravitate to this quote by Paul Graham quite often, uh, which is, unlike winning an Olympic gold medal where the problem is well defined, building a successful company is actually more like a science where you need to follow the trail wherever it leads. And part of building our, our a successful business is, is very much uh, our digital strategy. And it's really no different when we're talking about what we're doing with the web and what we're doing with our content. I mean, I could sit here and, and roll through some uh, fabulously compelling statistics about mobile use and about device use. But you know, you've all heard them before. We all know it's there. Uh, the writing is there. It's on the wall. The trail is there for us to follow. All you really need to do is think about reality and think about your own life. Uh, any of you that ride the train or commute, I mean, take a look around. You're probably half the people on that train with you are using some type of a mobile device to consume content in some way or another. You know, maybe they're on Facebook. Maybe they're doing email. Maybe they're reading. They're all consuming content, and they're doing it on a regular basis. Uh, more and more of us sit on our couch at home watching television with our mobile devices right in front of us. Uh, same thing, watching television, interacting at the same time, and consuming content. Um, this is a common thing that's happening. I don't think I need to tell you that from statistics. It's, it's fairly obvious. And I don't think we need to look much further than a couple of examples of companies that didn't really follow that trail and others that did. One that comes to mind quite often for me is, is the blockbuster versus Netflix uh, war, for lack of a better word, that's, that's gone on for quite some time. You know, back when digital was very, very young and the web was very, very young, blockbuster was the place for uh, video distribution. We all went to our local blockbuster store. We brought our card in. We rented a video. We brought it back. It was a wonderful service. And along came Netflix when the digital age came along and sort of upended that, uh, that whole model and decided to do this, the whole thing online. And Blockbuster really wasn't prepared for that. They didn't take digital seriously in the beginning. They really stuck to their brick and mortar strategy. Uh, Netflix just took, of course, a huge market share away from Blockbuster. And Blockbuster was, of course, forced to react. 
The mistake they made, however, was while they were busy reacting to Netflix business model and trying to change theirs to be somewhat online as well, Netflix was already ahead of the game and Netflix was already investigating and investing in streaming media. Even before streaming media was really viable, I can remember reading the articles when it first came out and thinking, well, that's, that's going to be great in three or four years, but right now it's just not, it's not tenable on, on, uh, on the bandwidth that we have. But Netflix looked into the future. They followed the trail. So while Blockbuster was doing what they had done three years ago, Netflix was already three years ahead. Um, now, since then, of course, Netflix has had their share of problems unrelated to that, but the point here is really that Netflix followed the trail and, and Blockbuster really didn't. Another great example of, of companies who sort of changed their mindset and changed their business model based on where they saw the trail leading was PayPal. Uh, many of you may or may not know that PayPal actually started originally as a cryptography company. And then when uh, the PDAs came out, personal, personal digital assistants, they morphed again and, and saw that as a way to transmit money from one PDA to another. So they used their cryptology technology, looked at the, at the technical landscape moving forward, changed their business model. And then they went even further than that. Once they saw the, the, uh, the value of the web and the value of transactional web, they morphed that model once again to really become uh, you know, one of the de facto online gateways for millions of people and businesses throughout the world. So just a great example of a company that saw the writing on the wall, followed the trail, and, and made a success story of it. For those of you who are old enough to remember these companies that we see here in front of us, Xerox, Kodak, and NCR, I think there were, we could all honestly say there was a day when we never thought these companies would be anything but great. They were huge, powerful, strong companies. And for a variety of reasons, um, certainly part of it was their inability to adapt to the technological landscape. These three companies are now basically former shells of themselves. Uh, and that really, in my opinion, has a lot to do with their inability to, uh, to, to, uh, to move forward and to morph with what they saw moving forward. So we have to ask ourselves the next question. We've convinced that we've got to do something. So we have to ask if, if responsive design is really the right choice for you and for your project. Typically, when we uh, talk to a customer or we look at a particular project to decide if responsive is the right choice, there are a couple of different things that we, that we really look at. The first is the audience. And uh, one of the most important things is really understanding your audience. And the tough part here is that oftentimes we think we do. Um, we often, uh, you know, we've done a lot of research in the past, we've done a lot of analytics, looking at our analytics, and because of that we feel like we know our audience pretty well. Uh, the problem here is that the digital landscape changes so fast that there are a lot of preconceived notions about our audience that we may be falling into and not realizing at the time. A couple of real common myths that we hear a lot are particularly around analytics, because that's really one of the best windows into our websites as to who's coming and who's visiting our site. And I hear a lot of times from clients, well, we looked at our analytics, and right now, uh, you know, 5 or 6% of our, our customers are coming via mobile devices, so we really don't feel like that's uh, a big enough audience yet to make such a big commitment and to modify our digital strategy. And my answer to that is, is usually to, to take that number very carefully, because is that number 5 or 6% because only 5 or 6% are coming to our site via mobile? Or is it 5 or 6% because the experience we're giving them is so poor that they don't come or they never come again? Um, I was recently talking to Daniel Seeger from McGraw-Hill. Uh, McGraw-Hill, many of you may know, uh, was sort of what you would consider a textbook publishing company uh, for, uh, for education. And now they've changed quite dramatically in recent years to become more of an online learning or an e-learning type of a, of a company. And they recently, recently went through a responsive uh, design project. And Daniel was telling me that prior to the project, their mobile traffic was 12% uh, of their total audience. Immediately following the launch of their responsive site, it jumped to 29%. So it increased by approximately 2.5 uh, well, two fold, 250%, simply from the time they went from desktop only to responsive. So it wasn't that that many more people were suddenly coming to their site because they were responsive. Those people always were coming to their site. They were just losing them, or they were waiting and coming, you know, waiting until they get to their office and accessing them via, via desktop. So I think we have to be very careful when we review our analytics and decide what we really think people are doing in terms of um, how they're accessing our site. 
second common myth that we hear a lot of is that people using mobile don't want to consume full content. With that, I'm always uh, careful to tell people not to confuse content, context with content. We oftentimes think because a user's on mobile, they don't want all of the full content. We used to think that, well, people on mobile are in a rush, they're online at the grocery store, they're in between things, they're looking for quick little snippets, uh, what some people might call truncated content. And really, we have to make sure that we're very careful about that because trunc truncation is just not a good content strategy. Giving people less than the full version is just a, a dangerous line to walk these days. Uh, the example I like to use is that I have a, a fairly long commute to work every day. I live about 40 miles from my office. And I thought it would be a real prudent use of my time uh, to subscribe to a Books on Tape service, um, just so I could do something more than uh, listen to mindless radio all the time. And that would be really great. You know, I like to read. I like to get uh, information on a lot of different sources. So I signed up for a service online. Uh, you know, similar to Netflix, they send me out the, uh, the CD of the books I want to read. I keep a nice queue going. And when I got my first book, I was very excited. So I popped it into my CD player in my car and drove to work. And about an hour later, I was done with the book. And what I didn't realize at the time was that books on tape are an abridged version of the actual book. And I felt very dissatisfied with that experience because I wanted the full version. I wanted all the content. I have a long drive. And if it took 20 drives back and forth to read that book or hear that book, that was fine with me. But I didn't want a partial version. So of course, I canceled the service. But as a user, I just felt cheated. And I think it's very similar with a lot of strategies that companies are taking now with mobile is that they give them a smaller subset of their full content. And that's a dangerous assumption to make because ultimately you're really assuming that your user doesn't want to consume all that content. I mean, quite frankly, uh, you know, nowadays outside of the office, I probably do 90% of my web browsing on my phone or on my, on my tablet. And I want all that content, and I think more people do. Uh, today's what I call power users, you know, people in their late teens, early 20s, those are the people that are now becoming the buyers. They're becoming the decision makers. They grew up with this technology. They've had this all along. They're quite comfortable uh, consuming large portions of content on their phones. We were recently doing some research for one of our higher ed clients uh, in terms of uh, expectations of uh, prospective students, college-bound students. And their expectations for digital are very, very high. They expect to, be, to do everything on their phone that they can do on that website, from downloading course information to signing up for classes, to being able to, uh, to, to book meetings with their, uh, with their counselors. And one of the real important things for them, for prospective students, was to be able to share information with their parents. So they wanted to be able to find something on the, on the site and then email it or share it with their, with their parents or, with their, or their friends. Now again, go back to what we were discussing earlier. If we don't have a, a mobile-friendly site, and I look at something on a particular uh, university's website and I share that with someone and they get on their mobile phone and click to go see it, now they can't or they get a, or they get a, a trimmed down experience. So these are things that are really, they're really real today and we have to consider them. We can't just assume people want small pieces of content. Another common one and the final one I'll touch upon is that, uh, you know, we hear a lot that people don't want to do complex tasks on their phones. They want to just get quick, simple information. Well, my favorite argument to that is, uh, is a statistic by eBay, who currently sells approximately 2,500 cars a day via mobile devices. And if buying a car is not a complex tax task, I'm not quite sure what is. And that's pretty compelling. And again, I think if you talk to uh, the power users of today, we're all quite happy to transact online. We buy things online. We book hotels online. We do all of that on our mobile devices, and we're okay with complex tasks. As long as they're presented to us in a usable fashion, we're happy to do them. The second piece to really talk about uh, when determining if responsive is the right choice for your project is really understanding your content. Um, this is probably the most important part of it, because there's just some situations where your content dictates that responsive might not be the best choice for you. A couple of examples that we look at are uh, where sites that maybe aren't the best uh, uh, for responsive design. One is a site with a lot of rich content, particularly with a lot of advertising. Uh, any of you that have sort of followed the responsive uh, talks really understand that advertising is a big part of, uh, of the debate right now. 
Um, advertisers pay for, for certain dimensions of space, and they want uh, those ads have to, have to show on certain portions of the site based on cost and price. And wrapping that into a responsive design can be very, very tricky. Also, sites with super rich content like Amazon, where you have uh, you know, everything from um, uh, reviews to similar products to uh, things that you've bought previously that are like that. that. There's a lot of content to put on one page. And sometimes reorganizing that in a responsive manner can be quite a challenge. It sometimes makes better sense to have a mobile version of that particular site where you can completely re relay out the entire user flow, completely relay out the user experience, um, and make it more palatable for your user. Another common example, which is similar to rich content, but, uh, not, uh, but somewhat different, uh, are sites with complex, what we call complex functionality. And when we say complex functionality, we're talking about things like uh, really deep, rich, faceted searches, um, sites for like Best Buy, for example, where I can save five or six products and then compare them side by side afterwards. Those, from a, from a display perspective, can sometimes be a bit of a challenge with a responsive site. And again, it might make sense in those particular situations to, to think about other, other alternatives. The final thing that we look at are what I call non-adaptable designs. Um, sometimes there are just designs that aren't going to work in a responsive setting. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a, web, a little website put out by Google a little while ago called The Life of an Email. It was a really great interactive piece that allowed users to sort of stop and, uh, and click around and see sort of what happens with an email from the time they, they write it to the time they send it uh, to when the user receives it. And as you can see by looking at the screen, it's very visual, uh, it's very interactive, to try to do this responsibly just wouldn't work. And there are occasions when your site or your application, your web application or your user interface just requires space. And if it requires that space, it might not be the best, uh, best suited for a responsive project. So these are some examples of you know, when you might uh, decide that it's not the right fit for you because it isn't going to be the right fit for every occasion. And you really should have uh, you know, a very considered conversation with yourself and a very considered conversation with the other stakeholders to decide if it's going to work properly for you or not. So now you've decided that it is the right choice. The big question on the table, of course, is how do we go about doing it? Common thing that we hear a lot. Should we start over, build a brand new website? Or can we retrofit our current website? I mean, in an ideal world, of course, we'd always love to start over and start from scratch. Um, but it's understandable this is not always a viable alternative for people. You know, oftentimes you've just finished designing your new site. You've just gone through a whole content inventory and rewriting all your content. And to have to do that over again just might not be budgetarily or labor-wise really effective for you. And you might have to actually re you know, make the choice of retrofitting your current site. It's not the perfect scenario, but we've done it. It certainly is doable. Um, you know, I think you just have to sort of take a look at it like anything. We look at any web design project very similar to building a house or building any structure. And this is no different. You know, we look at our, our current house right now, we could ask ourselves the question, you know, I need to build an in-law or create an in-law apartment. Should I take my garage and should I change that and, and make that a, into an in-law apartment for my folks? Or should I go buy a new house? And there's no right or wrong answer here. You know, sometimes you have to look at your particular house or in this case your particular website and see if retrofitting is possible. Things that might be a challenge to retrofitting are um, if you have a lot of uh, old legacy HTML in place, for example. Um, you know, a lot of tables, a lot of things that would be very difficult to, uh, from a code perspective, modify into a responsive site. And that's really something that you have to, you know, talk with your development team, talk with your design team, and find out, you know, what the state of your site is right now and how much of it you'd have to rewrite in order to make it responsive. You know, that, that can be very difficult. If your site was written fairly recently using a lot of modern techniques, it might not be so bad. The other thing to consider in, uh, in deciding if you want to retrofit is really understanding that responsive design, as we said before, isn't only about layout. So if we're looking at our current website and saying, well, 
we're going to re retrofit the layout so that it now responds to all these devices. That's fine, but is your site really, from a content perspective and from a usability perspective, a good experience for, its, for the end user? And that's the one drawback to retrofitting, is oftentimes it doesn't allow us to go through that exercise of really taking a close look at our content and taking a good look at our experience and, and deciding if we're delivering the right information to people and we're delivering it properly, uh, regardless of device. You know, we hear a lot of talk about um, you know, mobile first out there and people really talking about thinking mobile first with content and with their websites and with their design. And I really like to think about mobile first, particularly from a content strategy perspective. Taking the time to really think about how your content should come out on mobile really puts some laser focus on you and allows it, it really forces you to think about your messaging and to get your content that's important to people. And as I said before, we got a little bit sloppy. Um, you know, we got our websites all got a little bit too fat and we started dumping a lot of content in there and because we could. And is that really the best thing to take our old content and then try to adapt it to, uh, to a, a more responsive environment? You know, perhaps, perhaps not. The next step, and probably the most important in any responsive project, is analyzing your content. Uh, you know, I said before that uh, 2013 was the year of content, and I really believe that. And in the past, you know, we tended to follow a little bit more of a, uh, of a waterfall approach and put our content at the end of our projects, and I just don't think we can do that anymore. Our design, our, our websites, our messaging, our layout, all depends on our content and what our content really is. And I think it's really important for us to, at the beginning of a project, understand and refine and define our content. More and more, we're really thinking about preparing our content for, for more than just our website. We're preparing it for mass distribution. Uh, Karen McGrain, a wonderful user architect, likes to refer to this as chunking content. And that's really taking your content and breaking it up into pieces that can be dispersed into a lot of different places. A common example might be looking at uh, something as simple as an article on your website. Well, in the past, we might have just dumped that article into one big, rich content uh, area on our CMS and pushed it out there. But really, we should be thinking about taking that article and, and breaking it up into pieces of, of, of chunkable content that can be reused and redistributed, not only across the web, but maybe other places. Could be print, could be RSS, could be uh, through our email systems, could be through our social uh, avenues. So taking something like an article and breaking it up into things like a title, an author, an abstract, a short description, a longer description, things of that nature, you know, really make sense moving forward in the digital space. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, over the past few years, the past 10 years or so, um, the first and second generation content management systems kind of made us sloppy. Uh, we, we had the space, so we used it. It's kind of like, we go back to the home analogy, it's kind of like our garage in our house. When we all first bought our homes, our garages were nicely organized. We had our, our content, if you will, neatly dispersed across our garage, our garden tools over here, uh, you know, our, 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 our winter stuff over here. Five and ten years later, we had the space, so we used it. We started dumping everything in there, and now our garages are just an unmanageable mess. And CMS has somewhat made, that, uh, made our websites that way as well. We had space to put content, so we did. And we dumped it all in there, and we thought more was better. And now it's all out there, but is it really good content? Is the user experience good? Can we reuse that content in other areas? Probably not. So, you know, part of the responsive project is really about defining your content and preparing your content for reuse in a lot of other places. It's really okay to put rules in place around your content, and responsive design is, is helping us to do that in many ways. The final thing to think about with your content is content is not just about your words either. They're also about your user experience and your UI and how you're providing that content to your users. I like to use the phrase that design without context or meaning is just decoration. And it's really true. So if we're analyzing our content, we're really thinking about how we should lay that content out on our pages with responsive in mind and making sure that we're doing so that's going to be appropriate for our users in the end. So once we've analyzed our content, the next step we like to do is uh, do what we call starting with the foundation. And by starting with the foundation, we're really referring to the common element
elements of the website. So if you envision your home page or you envision your inner page, your basic inner page of your site, there are really some common elements that you're going to find there. Typically speaking, there's such things as your utility navigation. Uh, maybe you have a top navigation up top. Um, you know, you might have your uh, your footer, your left navigation on your inner pages. Uh, maybe you have a standard sort of two-column template where you have a particular type of call-outs that you like to put on the right side of your page. Look for these common elements. And then what we like to do is we like to think of breaking these pieces apart, thinking about how these individual pieces will respond to different viewports, and making the decision about what they should do in those different sizes. These are oftentimes referred to as pattern libraries. So you might take your top navigation. That would be one pattern library and decide what will my navigation do when my viewport is 800 pixels, 700 pixels, 600 pixels. How will it respond? How will it change? What will it look like for all these different users? And then we make decisions based on content, not on the viewport size. So we don't start the project saying, we're going to build a response to the site, and we're going to base our on a viewport of the iPad and the iPhone. We don't do it that way. We take these individual pieces, and we start shrinking them down. And when things start getting ugly or messy, we make a decision. And that could be anywhere. That could be at 842 pixels, for example. So if that's the case, then we're going to put a breakpoint at 842 pixels, and we're going to change or modify that piece of content to look nicer in that next series of sizes. So it's really important to take these individual pieces and break them down like that at a foundational level first. Because once we get our foundation in place, we have the basics and probably 80% of our project already complete at that point. We can now start to focus on some of the finer points of our content, dig a little bit deeper, and, uh, and, and touch upon some of the more complex pieces of our site. The next part of the project really is to get involved. And this is very, very important. And this is for all parties, not just if you're hiring a team to do this. This is also for the team itself. The old days of the waterfall approach of um, user experience to design to development just doesn't work anymore. We all need to be involved every step through the process. We all need to talk about what the site should do and how the site should respond. And uh, it's important for you as well if you're hiring a team to involve yourself as well. Don't make it their problem. It's not just a technical problem. It's about your content. It's about your message. I always ask people, would you let me redecorate your house without your involvement? Probably not. So don't let me redo your site without your involvement as well, particularly when it comes to responsive. And the final piece of this is really testing. And you know, it's one of the most important, as you can imagine. Uh, it takes a lot of time to do. Uh, don't rush yourself through it. Uh, this can be tough for a lot of people um, because of the fact that we're talking about four or 500 different devices out there. Don't just test this on your iPhone and your iPad. Don't just sit there and resize your browser up, up, up and down. Try to find as many devices as you can. If you're working with an agency, find out about their testing lab and what devices they're using. Look, I've gone down to my local Verizon store my, or, or, my, or my local uh, Apple store, and I've gone around on all the devices inside the store and tested sites I've been working on. There's nothing wrong with that. It gives me another chance to sort of see what different devices are doing. It's just a very important step and one that should not be overlooked. OK, so what have we ultimately learned here? Well, we've learned a few things. Uh, we've learned that responsive is uh, not the only answer. It's not for every project. Um, I love it. I think it's a great alternative. But we really need to analyze carefully and decide if it's right for your project. It's not simply resizing your website. It's about more than that. At the end of the day, like any digital strategy, it's about your user's experience across different devices. And it's about adapting your site to serve those different devices and to serve your users. It's not a mobile strategy. Responsive is about all devices, not just mobile. It could be about televisions. It could be about displays in cars. It could be about uh, you know, your, your refrigerator with Wi-Fi. I mean, all these different things out there that either are there or could be there. It's really about a content strategy. It's about delivering your content. And it, with that, it's part of your overall content delivery strategy. Again, 2013 is a year of content. In the past, we used to segment or silo our content in all different locations. Our print content was different from our social content, was different from our web content. We really need to start thinking now about not siloing or forking our content anymore, but bringing it all together into one place. Remember, your content is your secret sauce. 
when you need to effectively get that to any user in any environment. That's your message. Responsive is device agnostic. I keep repeating this because I have this conversation all the time with folks, and it's a hard barrier to break. It's not just iPad and iPhone. It's anything and everything. It's about being future friendly, and that's uh, you know what we talk about with devices. We don't know what devices are coming out in the future, so we have to make sure that we're ready for any of those. Ultimately, responsive design, it's about content, and it's about the user experience. And if there's nothing else you take from this presentation, please take that, because with any digital project, those are the most two most important pieces to, to, uh, to understand. Responsive is not a technical issue. It's not about making things look different. It's about these two things. It's about distribution of content. It's about creating that good, solid user experience. So with that, I want to thank you for, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to bear with me through this and my crackling voice. Uh, I'd also like to uh, take this moment to open it up to any questions that you might have. We've got a couple coming through right now. So uh, one of the first questions that came across is, uh, is there any advice for those of us considering a retrofit of our website and have a lot invested in non-responsive friendly content? And yeah, I touched upon this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tough situation, and I realize it may not be financially viable for you to completely tear everything down. Um, but it really is a, a time to really consider your messaging and your content. And, and, and take a look at that content really is going to be uh, responsive friendly or, or, or friendly for all your different users. Um, take that time to, to go through the process and clean your content out of nothing else. Maybe you can't take the time to redesign or take the budget to redesign your site um, or completely rebuild it, I should say. But do if you're going to invest anything, invest it in your content. That really is something that's um, probably the most important part of any project like this. Another question we have here is, um, technically, does this involve HTML or are other elements involved? So typically, uh, most of what you're doing from a technical perspective with responsive design is around your HTML and around your CSS. A big consideration, however, is um, your CMS, your, the content management system that you're using. Content management systems that allow you to uh, you know, break your content up into different pieces are always uh, going to be very beneficial for you. So CMSs like Kentico work really well with that. Um, you really should review your CMS and decide if it will work well in a, uh, in a responsive environment. Um, if you have a CMS that's just sort of a, a big, rich text open area that allows you to put whatever you want in there and sort of dump everything in there, it might be difficult to take that content and then uh, put it into a responsive environment. So that is a consideration um, that, that one should have. So we have another one coming in here. Uh, it says, I have a colleague who doesn't think that responsive design can be applied to complex web applications. So I'm trying to convince her that it can. If you focus more on the tasks you want the user to accomplish rather than trying to adapt a giant dashboard. Do you have an example of a complex web application that is also responsive? Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. And you know, one that we touched upon a little bit, and it is one of the debates, that something is really complex. Um, and uh, you know, does it respond well to a responsive environment? Off the top of my head, I don't have any direct examples I can give to you. I can tell you, however, that there's some great resources out there for um, being able to um, see a bunch of examples of responsive sites, and some of them simple, some of them very complex. The one coming to the top of my head is, I believe it's mediaqueries.es. I'm actually going to pull that up and look at it right now. Um, if it's not, you can Google that and you'll find it. But they literally um, modify their site on a daily basis with new responsive designs that have been put out there. And there's a plethora of different types of sites on there. I'm sorry, it's Media Query. So media, Q-U-E-R-I dot E-S. And they have tons of great examples. Um, you know, there's some that involve a lot of complex content, like Time Magazine recently launched a responsive site 
I think a lot of us are familiar with the Boston Globe, which was a new one, which is sort of the, the leader that started this whole thing. But I would go through there and see if you can find some good examples of, of complex. Another question we have here is, uh, what media query sizes do you, do you recommend to trigger on? Uh, again, that's a real common question. And you know, when we talked a little bit about before, um, there really are none. And you shouldn't go in with that determination. You should really let your content decide where you place your media queries. It's kind of a lot uh, like uh, you know, building a room and putting furniture in that room. You really shouldn't uh, ask me what size living room you should have. That li size of that living room should depend on a bunch of different options. It should depend on how you're going to use that room, the size of your family, the furniture that you have, how big is your television. There are a lot of different factors there. And the same thing is really true with media queries. We really want to use the rule of thumb that when my content starts getting ugly or messy, that's where I'm going to put a media query in, whatever that number happens to be. So at the end of the day, your site might have four or five different breakpoints. It could have 15 or 20. Um, you know, we try not to overwhelm it and have too many. We try to be somewhat pragmatic. But at the end of the day, the content really has to dictate it and let us know uh, where the best places to do this are. Another question we have here, um, are there platforms that cannot work with responsive design, i.e. SharePoint? Um, a good question. I, I think the real dependency here is a lot of it is how your platform uh, creates the HTML that goes onto your site. So if your platform writes its own HTML, it, can, it could be a challenge because it doesn't allow you to create HTML and the CSS that you can make in a responsive fashion. If your platform, however, allows you the flexibility and has that separation of, of design and presentation uh, where you can control the HTML, then you're fine. I mean, because the execution, ultimately, of a responsive project is really um, on the front end of the site. In other words, the HTML and the CSS. So as long as you can control those things through the system, then you should be uh, you should be fine. It looks like that's all we have for questions. Uh, we can hang on another moment or two longer if anyone has any more. Um, but with that, again, I'd like to thank you all for taking some time today. Uh, it's been my pleasure to talk to you a little bit about this. I uh, hope we gave you some 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 good information there, um, at least to get you started on what you should be thinking about. And that really, I think, is the most important thing, is to, uh, to understand the questions you want to ask and the research that you want to do. Uh, ultimately, with the success, success of any project, it's around that. It's about doing your research and making sure that you understand whether it's the best solution for you or not. Um, so again, I'll thank you all very much. And uh, thank you for attending. Thank you very much, Scott, for spending the time with us today. A uh, quick question for you. If people wanted more information and wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? They can visit our website, bostoninteractive.com. Uh, all the information and contact information they can find right there. They can find information about uh, our projects, about our philosophy, about responsive, uh, as well as uh, direct contact to our entire management team. Excellent. Well, Scott, once again, thank you very much for spending the time with us today. For everyone that's attending, uh, barring any major technical difficulties, as we always do, we'll record it and make it available at Kentico, excuse me, at devnet.kentico.com slash videos.aspx over the next couple of days. So with that, I'll let everyone go and have a fantastic day. And thanks again, Scott. Thank you, Tom.